first time this morning. Nice. Nice. Welcome. I think you guys will enjoy it. Uh, the rest of you who have been here before, you kind of know the drill. We have two presentations. They come up, they present for six minutes each, tell you about the companies they're building here in Tampa Bay, what kind of cool things are going on. Then there's 20 minutes of Q&A from you guys. Ask questions, seek clarification, but also uh, give advice. Think through the connections that you have that could help these companies grow here. Um, it's a big responsibility in exchange for all of that. Uh, Kawa Coffee has decided to donate free coffee to you. So we thank them for that. We thank them for uh, keeping us going, keeping us upright, as always. My name is Sean Kennedy. I'm an organizer here uh, for One Million Cups, along with JJ Roberts and a bunch of people that are slacking off. If you want to know who they are, they're going to I don't even want to say their names. Uh, but without further ado, I will, I will kick it over to John, who will tell us about the symptoms. Yeah, that's All right. Thank you very much. And thank you all for coming. I feel very honored to be here and to tell you about a project that I've been passionate about for the past couple of years. I looked this up before coming here. You saw the tagline, the all-in-one charging station, kickstand, Bluetooth headset carrying, convenience-minded, cell phone grip enhancing, mobile multimedia dream machine. Uh, it's a bit wordy, I admit, but it's difficult to describe a genre, new genre of product in just a couple of words. Uh, before I get into exactly what the stand-in is, I would like to go into the future, specifically the future as depicted in movies, and one of the movies that I feel best depicted the uh, future of this technology was the movie Her. In the movie, the protagonist uh, always had a Bluetooth headset on him, and it, it delivered personal audio input, personal audio output, and his phone was always held effortlessly and conveniently while it allowed for input, viewing, charging, and recording video all while standing up. So these features all make sense. So why don't we have them in today's phones? The stand-in is just that. It attaches to the back of your phone, has a kickstand built into it, has a Bluetooth headset built into it, and charges the phone and the headset at the same time all while standing up. So why should you want this? Well, if you ever used a Bluetooth headset, you know that the headset requires charging on a daily basis, and you have to keep track of the headset at all times. Since the stand-in has a built-in Bluetooth headset that charges from the same plug as your phone, you'll never have to remember to charge your Bluetooth headset again. And plus, next time it rings, you'll know right where the headset is. Now, any additional bulk of adding a Bluetooth headset to the back of your phone is not something you took lightly. So we developed the thinnest Bluetooth headset ever made at only eight millimeters thick. It's also one of the most comfortable Bluetooth headsets I've ever worn. You may also be one of those people who use their phone on a pretty regular basis and your battery dies before the end of the day. With the stand-in, your phone now charges while standing up with the built-in kickstand. So you can charge your phone all day at your desk while you're using it. So no matter how much you use your phone, You'll never have to worry about dying in the middle of the day. Plus, when you leave for the evening, you'll have a fully charged phone to get you through the evening. Uh, both the headset and the kickstand use a unique spring locking mechanism that provides constant tension in both the open and closed positions. Uh, for the headset, this ensures a lock, properly locked headset when you're stowing it. And when you're using it, it's very comfortable in the ear and it feels you know, very solid. You'll also enjoy locking kickstand since insurers won't accidentally deploy the kickstand when it's not in use. And uh, when you are using the kickstand, you can watch in portrait and landscape mode. Uh, you may have noticed that uh, watching any media on your phone requires you to give a free hand and bring along a separate headset. But with the combination of a kickstand and a headset with you at all times, the stand in delivers a personal media center in your pocket. So even in the loudest areas, you can now watch your favorite Hulu, Netflix, YouTube, Vine, and Twitch videos on the go. Uh, I know none of you have ever dropped your phones, right? The stand-in provides a unique arch grip kickstand that wraps around your fingers, 
So you can now hold your phone uh, conveniently with a single hand uh, without ever being concerned about dropping it. So the Kickstarter is coming soon. Uh, we have a long road ahead of us and we can really use your support. Uh, right now, the most helpful thing is you just uh, like us on Facebook, uh, follow us on Twitter. Uh, thanks again for having me and I look forward to uh, hearing your questions. I actually have a stand-in on the back of my phone right here, so our, our latest 3D printed prototype here. Uh, fully functioning, charge your phone, uh, again, has the locking headset, like goes in your ear, and um, yeah, it's uh, it's already been enhancing my life, so I'm sure it'll help uh, other people as well. Any questions? <laughs> I know I didn't do that good a job. What's your anticipated call for you? Uh, currently, we're estimating around 40 to 60, depending on how we're looking to get manufactured. We'd love to be at the $40 uh, price point, um, but we're uh, go to 60 if we need to. And that will work with any phone, or is it? Are you starting with Android phones and doing iPhones or vice versa? Yeah. So the only thing that really um, would affect the phones that we can use it on um, are the four types. So right now, there's micro USB. Uh, there's a new USB uh, coming out called USB Type C, um, and then there's obviously the iPhone Lite. Um, so we're planning on supporting all uh, all those different port types. Great question. How are you attached to the phone? Yep. Yeah, uh, so we have a three M adhesive uh, that attaches to the back of the phone. Um, it's 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 rock solid, so it's not going to off your phone. Um, however, you can get um, you know, if you just triple take the back cover off, you can drip a little water there, and it, uh, it slides right off with no residue on your phone. How did you determine your market? Who do you see using it? Do you have certain niche groups? Do you have a target right now? Absolutely. So I'm sure you've heard of these millennial people. Um, they're always a tech glue with their phones. Um, really, it's any power user, though. So anybody that uses their phone on a regular basis, anybody that watches a lot of YouTube videos, uh, anybody that um, does video conferencing, that's another great thing. Is you have now a video conferencing center in your pocket so you can high quality audio, the cameras, Dancing when your hands are free. Uh, so, business users, millennials, or any power users of the phone. How would you reach that target? Um, so, you know, LinkedIn marketing, Facebook marketing, you can, you can get pretty segmented and targeted with that. Um, a little bit of display and um, a lot of word of mouth is what we're going for. I'm um, going to be doing a you know, pretty hard social media campaign, posting a blog, some forums. Um, so, some real marketing stuff, but just not too big at the moment. Great question. Any pre-launch tests on marketing? Uh, so I have a couple, you know, close friends, you know, family that I've been you know, providing headsets to, getting feedback on um, ahead of time. So just trying to get as much feedback as possible, but uh, no kind of you know large beta because right now the three D printed prototypes are all hand soldered, three D printed, and it's uh, it's quite quite a major process at the moment. So you're like the time to get what's your when's your date? So we don't have a hard date set yet. The way Kickstarter works is you need to have a large backing before you actually launch. Um, and so you need to get your Kickstarter rule at least 50%. Um, and then you get on the front page of Kickstarter. Um, at that point, when you launch, then everything can explode because you know, the general public is seeing it. But until then, it's all your marketing. So you want to get as far as possible um, advanced you know, with Facebook or Twitter and any all social platforms. And then when you're launching, just it'll take off uh, if you launch too soon, then it uh, won't go anywhere. Yes, sir. Yeah, what does your Kickstarter roadmap look like? What's, what's your intention to make sure it scales off the platform? So Kickstarter roadmap, um, like I said, it's important to have the funding as far as, uh, you know, as much as possible up front. Um, and then you know, have good manufacturing so that uh, you know, as soon as you reach your goal, then you can push the button and, and you can get there. Right now, it depends on kind of how successful you're on Kickstarter as far as kind of how far afterwards the Kickstarter I, might, I should probably ask a different question. What what do you want to tell? What is your story going to be on the platform? Um, pretty much the presentation you just saw here. So uh, the fact that you, know, you have a built-in Bluetooth headset, built-in portable pocket media center, you never have to worry about dropping your phone again, basically all the conveniences that the other product offers. I'm just going from left to right here. Um, have you patented any, any of your uh, Ideas or yes, we have uh, multiple multiple patents um, pending for uh, various aspects of the device. Um, how do 
did you pick your team of people? Who is on your team? Do you feel that you're ensuring your success by the skills and collaboration of your team? I can tell you every person on the team is a very close personal friend of mine that I've known for many years, mostly because it's pretty much just me. <laughs> I have my father here who's also helped out a little bit uh, with the, um, some, some general marketing. So in that respect, how did you come to, uh, to this idea and what's your background? Sure. Um, my, my background is actually marketing, um, but uh, you know, pretty much just been a geek um, my, my entire life. So I love 3D printing. I've you know, made programming virtual reality applications, programming Android applications. So. Um, I've wanted them to build Bluetooth headsets into phones for years. Actually, I, mean, I thought they were going to do it when I was around college, but they, they never do it. They never have done it. So I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to do it myself. Um, so I uh, basically started. The first prototypes were god awful. I actually brought some of my head to show you because it was just horrible. Um, but after a couple hundred prototypes later, this is where we're at. Um, and pretty proud of what we were able to accomplish. Yes? Um, I know Solid did its phone. You did a, like a uh, display on, on the internet, and you show everything, because I thought maybe be, you show it today. Where do I find oh, 3D like, animation? 3D animation, because that's a really good. Yeah, so we have a great 3D animation that shows exactly how the, uh, the standard functions, all the features, very similar to the presentation you just saw. It's uh, on synergywiz.com. Uh, so I have car business cards back uh, next to uh, John Kine there with the uh, headsets. <laughs> But uh, then my just cards right back there, so you can check out the uh, website. Would you like to bring it up on the screen? Uh, sure. Yeah, I can. Uh, yeah, let's see. Uh, let's see. Yeah, okay. Well, I do that. How long do you get charged to do for on the uh, how much will it charge you? Uh, six, six hours of uh, constant listening or playback. Okay. So, decent sized battery. Or chipset battery. Yeah, so I have the video that I gave you already, or if you want to scroll down, uh, that there it is right there. Oh. So, yeah, that's that's the full Kickstarter video. I'm going to turn the volume down on this. So you guys can... Does anyone else have any additional questions while we're on uh, videos uh, playing in the background? Yes. Are you going to try and take it retail? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So Kickstarter is going to be the first that's uh, going to allow us to ramp up manufacturing. And uh, from there, uh, you know, any retailers um, that we can, uh, can go with. Probably uh, starting online, then you know, definitely going to be working towards getting retail. So the, the mobile accessory market, so crowded marketplace, is, it is, uh, is there a particular vector that wouldn't let you stand out. I don't know if it's attempting to compete on. Well, we stand out with the stand in. <laughs> uh, but, you know, getting in contact with one of the local HSN or as seen on TV or something like that, just to think. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're here to make as many connections as possible, talk to many people, just get the word out. Um, and uh, from there, um, you know, HSN, any kind of retailers, anyone we can really. Uh, really pitch it to, um, that, that's how it's really going to take off. There's really nothing else like it out there. So you mentioned the mobile market's very crowded. Um, in fact, we have uh, patents on it, and um, it's, it's very, very, very unique. So um, I think uh, we won't have too much competition in the area, but uh, you never know. Yes? How much uh, capital would you need to start production on it, and where would you have it uh, produced? Don't say China. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have a uh, couple, I guess, first question. Um, right now we need about uh, $40,000 uh, with, with current manufacturing manufacturers that we've been talking to and working with. Um, and where we're going to have manufactured, um, I'd love to do it in the United States, uh, but you know, we're, we're open to all manufacturing options that are uh, the most cost effective. I was afraid of that, that's where I said that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, yeah, you have I mean, to do what you have to do. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to. I'd love to do it in the, in the United States. I'd love to, you know, do it um, lo locally here in St. Pete. Um, just depends on how low we get the cost. Yes. Okay. Um, how does it charge? I, I know you were explaining that 
But Excellent question. Does that like plug into the port and then you charge? Yeah, the so there's a micro USB input here and a micro USB output at the bottom here for the uh, headset. And then on the phone, there's a little, um, little nub here. And we're going to get the smaller for the final product. It's just obviously three for the prototype. Um, and this plugs in the phone. And there's a single charging port right here. And so you just put it down the table, you've got the charger port right there. And now your phone is charging while it's standing up and it's you know, accessible and easy for you to use all day. Yeah, so have you thought about uh, licensing it or trying to tie it with somebody else? Yeah, so uh, you know, we're relatively early stages here. We do have a manufacturer set up, but licensing is something we're open to. So if uh, a larger company wanted to license our product, we'd be very open to having a discussion about it. So if anyone here knows of any companies that would be or could possibly be interested, I uh, would definitely love for you guys to uh, you know, give me a shout. Yes? Is, is there a battery in it, or it's just a USB plug that, that feeds into the phones? So there's a battery in the headset, power the headset, obviously. Uh, but this part, it's just, uh, we try to make it as slim as possible. We, I was actually thinking we thought about that addition, a little bit of additional juice to your phone. But uh, with the room we had, it just made sense to just make it an additional plug. Um, there are, um, down the road, we're um, considering additional accessories. So right now, we just have Bluetooth headset in here. Um, but uh, let's say you're, you actually want um, a additional like small speaker you can place somewhere, or um, maybe a, a small little game pad if you're, uh, if you're an avid, avid gamer, you can have a little game pad to play games on it. So we're uh, anticipating other peripheral devices that will be able to slide in the back of the stand. Yes? Is your, uh, have, have you done all the testing on emanations from for the Bluetooth to be certified by anyone? Um, so that's part, of, that's part of working manufacturers that already have you know, certification, certifications to create Bluetooth devices. Um, so that is a, it's a huge hassle and a huge pain and it takes a fair amount of time. It's a great question. That's what we're trying to do is you know, go to manufacturers that are already you know, Is that part of your $40,000 $40, or is that additional <laughs> to uh, certify um, it's, in that configuration? But it has to be like configuration certified. Yeah, so it's um, it, it's part of the $40,000, but like I said, we're, we're trying to meet a $40, $60 price point, so depending on how low we keep the costs, uh, depends on you know, the end price point of the product. Yes. So the, um, a couple of things. The first is um, when you started out the presentation, just about the presentation. Mm -hmm. um, it took me a while to get there. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I might suggest that you punch it up a little bit. Uh, okay. at, at the end, at the beginning, you were sort of doing jack of all trades. Here's all the things that it is. Mm -hmm. And I, I got, I got more than halfway through the list of the things that it is. Virtually the honest So I'm wondering if, it, if it's like if you could find the, if you say it is a unique product mm -hmm. in the marketplace, and if it is truly a unique product in the marketplace, you really should leave with that and say this is something totally new that nobody's ever seen before. Um, I can't believe thousands of people have already done it. It's such a cool idea. Right? That kind of thing. Okay. <coughs> It just took me a while to get there. Gotcha. Yeah, try, try to do that with the charging station kickstand, Bluetooth headset enhancing, you know, yada, yada, yada. Right. All of those different things. Yeah. It's like, can you distill that into sort of the, if you say you want to have a new product category, mm -hmm. name the category. You're the leader in the category, so what do you call it? It needs a, an edgy a tagline. Yeah. Edgy tagline, right? Makes so, sense. Uh, the next thing is I'm concerned about uh, the cool factor of Bluetooth headsets. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, they're not exactly tearing up the airwaves here in 2015. Right? Yeah, I mean, part of the problem years is... Years ago, yeah. it would have been okay, but now uh, you, you can get much smaller heads uh, uh, tooth that are much less <clears throat> much more intrusive. Yeah, and you have to charge them every night, you have to keep track from wherever you go. Right. Um, best for the is when you have on you, you can use. Right. Um, so, you know, trying to enhance the look of it, obviously, you know, make optimizations. Um, that, that's really the idea is, frankly, I, I like Bluetooth headsets, but I, I didn't have one until I had the stand in either. Because right. I just, it was inconvenient. Um, I hated having to charge it, and right. I hated having to keep track of it. So I just got rid of it, which in, in our hypothesis is part of the problem with Bluetooth headsets. And 
hard problem solving. Well, there's two parts of that. There's the practicality of it, but then there's also sort of the, the fashion part of it, right? Mm -hmm. And if you can minimize the, the look, that, that Bluetooth look, you know, that kind of went out of style. The problem is people, people were wearing it all day, so it's like, you know, you're on the phone, you're not on the phone, why are you wearing it, you're not on the call, so I think that's part of the problem. Um, that's also part of the solution that you have to work with here. Yeah, just maybe play that up and say, you know, this it was too much or something. Yeah. Some sort of a, a social shaming. <laughs> because there, there was try, try not to bring too much shame to Bluetooth headsets. <laughs> but, but there was, there's a time. I mean, it's, yeah. the time is sort of passed on that look. One opinion, right? Mm -hmm. I thought your visuals were really nice. They were very, very clean. Um, I, I don't know if you're aware of this, but you're speaking in a room and talking to this, which probably you guys over here can't hear what I'm saying. Okay. So, so when you're speaking in a room and talking to us, I'm getting about 35% of what you're saying, but gotcha. I don't want to interrupt you because you're on a roll up there. <laughs> and so I'm going, well, this guy has this great product, but um, just that far out, I, I can't hear most of what you're saying. Okay. Just, just because your voice is in a normal talking voice, we need to turn away. Um, some of the audience, a percentage of those have hearing impairments, are not tracking it. Gotcha. We want to. So. All right. Well, thank you. Okay. Does it uh, interfere with any other wearables, like walk smartwatches? So uh, no other smartwatches. It's a standard Bluetooth headset, so it falls on the same protocols. Um, the uh, the only kind of interference that I've experienced would be um, the a Gear VR headset. This is a Samsung phone. I have a Gear VR headset, and um, I just take the, uh, the back plate off here, and then I can attach it to the uh, that peripheral. But aside from that, I haven't experienced do we have any uh, any interference with any additional peripherals. Um. So to take uh, our friend's point, that there, and help you out with that a little bit. Yeah. A lot of people don't realize that you can use Survey Monkey to create a survey. Everybody knows that. But they have a database they can send your survey out to so you can find your audience and then tell them that you want 500 responses to that and willing to pay, you know, dollar fees per response. Uh, you can take all the points that you're making here and show your audience and find out what's most important to them and then you can sharpen your message. Yeah, so that's, that's a great point. Yeah, I suppose just hypothesizing to them with that, it's uh, definitely good. Yes? Um, I was just kind of curious, how many people here use Bluetooth? In my car. You use car Bluetooth? Is that a car one? Oh, okay. <coughs> Bluetooth or the headset? The headset. I lost it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, there's a reason because you lost it. Then you don't use it. Wait, nothing by it, though. Uh, well, it's always on you, so you just, whenever you're on a phone call, you just plug it right back in. And then you always know where it is. Is it? No worries, just a uh, yes, sir. Um, does that, that clip stay on it all day in order to have it stand in? That clip has to stay on and all day. If it does, have you thought about uh, manufacturing a case? Because sometimes, you know, we don't want it in our pockets. Yeah, so well, um, I, I personally don't like cases. I realize other people, realize other people do. Um, so you can definitely we can have a version that incorporates a case into it. So it would be very, very thin here. And then the case would come out just a little bit. So it would be a minim, minimal bulge there. Uh, for me, I, I like having um, like having no case. So this actually keeps me form factor pretty small. Slips into your pocket without having to you know, be concerned about a case taking up your, your whole pocket. But um, definitely, I know there's an audience for that. So we're going to have a version with I guess I'll cover your hands. Yes, sir. I think you invested a lot of time and research on your product, and I think you came, with some, came up with something that's really cool and doesn't exist. So I think you've done everything well. The next step now is you need to get into the logistics of how you're going to distribute that, where you're going to market it, and distribute it. In cases like this, I think that you, got, you might need more capital than you think. Because if it takes off, and you're going to have a lot of demand, you're going to have a lot of orders that you're not going to be able to fulfill unless you have put those logistics in place. Yep. And uh, if it's the case nowadays, if people don't receive it, and 
the nail within the day or two after, mm -hmm. then they forget about you and you're going to lose a lot of sales. So I think that you've done your initial work, and now you need to do a lot more in market research to, to target, but be, make sure you have those logistics behind it yeah, to be able to deliver the product when it takes off. If it really takes off well, you're going to be overwhelmed. Yeah, and that's the kind of idea of the Kickstarter. So we have um, different, we have a couple of manufacturers set up. We have one manufacturer, if we just sell the minimum amount, uh, if, if the Kickstarter takes off, uh, we have a separate manufacturer we're going to go to that allow us to do Great. even higher quality product, you know, even more features, you know, higher quality materials. Um, so we have kind of different levels depending on how much, how far the Kickstarter goes. Um, and obviously, after the Kickstarter goes, if it's just the minimum amount of product, um, then, you know, we have to look at what we got the capital that we have. Um, and just kind of try to ramp up as, as quickly as we can. Yes, sir. What's the minimum you have to raise on Kickstarter? Uh, right now, the way we have it uh, broken down is about forty thousand dollars to uh, our kind of lowest end manufacturer. So, uh, you know, again, to play off what Steve just said about your logistics. This is and I'm, a, I'm a business coach to small startups, so mm -hmm. I see this all the time. You said two years which you spent developing. And I'm listening to you, and I haven't heard a word about your marketing plan. So yes, we understand 40 grand is your ramp up. Mm -hmm. But then, how do you market it? Are you going to go to trade shows? Are you, you know, going to fly all over the country to, to make presentations to Best Buy? Are you going to employ brokers? I mean, you, you need a whole new, a whole marketing. Digital marketing is my specialty. Um, so um, obviously, this is a stand up, uh, you know, startup, not making money right now. On my day job is at American Express, um, the digital marketing department there. So I know digital marketing pretty well. You know, we can do display, search, affiliate marketing. Um, and like I said, but that's, that requires budget. So what, yeah, so, so, what, yeah, so what's the budget for that? So I don't have the exact budget outline for each channel yet, um, but uh, we do a lot of guerrilla marketing as well. Uh, you know, we're just doing our own, you know, spending time doing our own social marketing, getting out there, telling people about it. Um, we have a plan to go, you know, obviously, uh, YouTube reviewers are huge for these kinds of devices. So getting out to all of them, Having them you know, have a you know, units to test, you know, talk about how great it is. is uh, okay, but my product. suggestion is, you know, whatever that number is, that mm -hmm. that costs something, and yep, you sure should does. be raising that money as well. Yeah, absolutely. Don't be afraid to raise more money. Don't be shy about that. You know, you might need a lot more money than that. And if it's a cool product and you need to focus on marketing, um, up your capital you need. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the uh, the only issue with that is Kickstarter. You have, like, you have to get to half your goal in the first couple of days to then get on the front page, which is you know, huge for marketing for Kickstarter. Um, so we want to make sure we're able to, to accomplish that goal. So there's a, just a, a fine line you want to balance. Along. Yes. So what can we as a community do to help you become a campaigner? So right now, we're just trying to build as big of a following as possible. Uh, if you guys could like us on, uh, on Facebook and uh, follow us on Twitter, that's that's really what we're trying to do right now, get as many followers as possible so that um, you know, your friends will see it on, uh, on social networks. They'll be interested, they'll click on it, they'll, they'll learn more, um, and uh, you know, hopefully it'll, it'll expand from there, this is our real goal. Thank you very much for that. Um, here in the middle, normally we talk about events, things that are coming up, stuff like that. Um, I don't have too many events this week. It's the, the dregs of summer. So Startup Exchange, which brewery is it at this Saint month? St. Brewery Company. St. Pete Brewery. Five to seven. Five to seven. Uh, great startup advice from a number of mentors and beer. Can't ask for much more than that. And then June 30th is Ignite Tampa Bay. We've talked about that a little bit in the past. It's uh, um, a series of, of talks given by members of the community and people who are very interested. Um, before we start the next presentation, I just want to give everybody a chance uh, to get a second cup of coffee, things like that. Um, please, uh, we'll meet back here in three minutes. I'm doing it because I need a second. <laughs>
standing, nobody sitting, plenty, plenty of chairs up front here. Uh, I, I have not reviewed the entire presentation for another day, but I'm pretty sure she has a fight. I don't know. Uh, well, so, our second presentation today, we've uh, had a pretty good history here at Million Cups of awesome educational presentations, new tools, new ways of looking at uh, education. I see uh, Christine in the back there, who will be presenting soon uh, to update on hers. Great job. Uh, George has had an educational bent in his timelines, things like that. But we have uh, today our good friend uh, LJ, who's going to talk about designing. <coughs> good morning. Thank you for coming. I'm going to start with a story. In 2014, I was invited to speak to a very large wellness conference in London. And a colleague of mine, Karen Ramsey, who lives in New Jersey, was also invited. And we were excited about the idea of hanging out in London together. And they were paying us a small stipend to take care of some of our expenses. And so Karen brought, she's a writer, and I am also a writer, and she brought a lot of books. So she was schlepping books because she wanted to offset her costs. I, on the other hand, I only brought, I've, I've written eight books, I brought a few sets of books to show at my table and to also give away. Uh, Karen gave a wonderful talk, as she always does, and she's a great writer, but she sold all of seven books. I, on the other hand, had a certification course to sell, and I sold one right there, so I broke even, and then I had people to follow through with, and was able to sell more courses and go immediately into a profit situation. So Karen's frustration was is that she knew she needed to have a course, but she had no idea, and I find this a lot with entrepreneurs and with small business owners, and even really good writers, they don't know how to repurpose their materials. So she hired me the next year, and I wrote a course for her, and she actually went back to London, sold her course right there, and wrote me that, and then went into a profit situation when she got back. So essentially what I do is I help small businesses and entrepreneurs to leverage their expertise into a money-making online platform or a course. Is it money making? Well, according to Forbes.com, in the beginning of 2015, this was already a $48 billion industry. And by the end of the year, it went to $115 billion. So it is a huge industry. What my husband and I did, because we also have a film production uh, and do commercials, we started looking into this and we found that there really is nobody offering this service to small businesses and entrepreneurs. Instructional design is rather expensive if you look into the companies that do the e-learning. So I realized that it was a skill set that came not only easily to me, but something that I really enjoyed doing. And of course I had a lot to learn about building the learning management systems. And so we started offering this and got a lot of really good response on it. A little bit of my own background, how I come to this. I'm a psychologist, but my specialty is in the subconscious mind and hypnotherapy, and I was an international trainer for many, many years. And I've been creating courses really since the 80s, and then in the uh, early 2000s, I was doing some online courses for some small universities. So, what I did is, uh, I, I would do the courses, but they weren't online, but in 2008, I was able to heal myself of an autoimmune disorder by making a big lifestyle change. And I started getting a following. I have, I do a lot of TV with this and a lot of classes, and I built a, 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 a good, uh, newsletter list. And so I realized that a lot of people were looking into becoming coaches in holistic health, but nobody had done a combination of life coaching with Holistic Health. So I thought of doing it and I put it out in the end of 2012 in a newsletter and I already had six people sign up, although I did not start to deliver the material until March of 2013. So here's a great advantage of online courses is that you can start to sell your online course even before you have the whole course or you could be doing a delivery it in pieces. <laughs> Uh, so I have been really basically living off of mainly passive income from 2013. That's another great advantage. It is another way to repurpose your information and materials. I also have global outreach. Right now we're in 12 countries. 
And another really fabulous thing is when I work with clients, I want to also project other courses in the future. We just last year started another certification course in clinical hypnotherapy, and 65% of my student base has signed on now for that other course. Now I am earning more money. Not all courses are academic. There are a lot of different platforms for using online. You could be using it for training. Years ago, I had a product line, and even for a while, we were at International Plaza, but when I was a wholesaler, my line was described as being informationally intensive. So we'd sell it to the retailers, but then their, their staff would sell it. Had I known about this, or had this even existed, I would have been able to train them. So there's a lot of different ways, and hopefully, <coughs> in the questions, I can explain some of the other platforms of online learning. So this is essentially what I have to say, and I hope to hear your questions. Thank you. What are the other platforms of online learning? Well, there is training. Uh, that's where you're finding a lot of the companies that, that are, are charging a lot of money are doing employee training, uh, instructional design for employee training. But I have worked with people not only to do consumer courses, for instance, you know, courses that, uh, for, I, I do a course that's called Napolinity Challenge. So that's a consumer course. So you can sell consumer courses, professional CEUs. I've written seven CEU courses for one of my clients, too. You have uh, just delivery of information. I'm working with doctors right now. For instance, I'm working with a surgeon. You can, you can have your, your, your patient ready beforehand and also be able to refer to it for recovery. And, and you can streamline information so that you're not using your staff to see, keep saying the same thing over and over and over again. So these are other different platforms. Yes? Are you working with our LMSs? Um, or are we using them? No, right now, I mean, I do have an LMS, and I'm thinking of actually creating kind of a large one. Right now, there's really, the only thing that's available like, is something like Udemy, but Udemy only gives you half the profit and also does not even give you email addresses, too, so that's not a great advantage. So, so sometimes what we do is we build the LMS. There are different ones like, uh, you know, for instance, LearnDash that can be used. We now are doing, yeah, with WordPress, there's Lifter, there's LearnDash, and, and with some of my clients, I, I, we're, you know, we're looking at kind of Teachable or Thinkific because they'll do, for a consumer course, they'll actually do a mailing too. Yeah, well, so it could be self-hosted or you could be hosting in one of these others. And we're actually actually building an LMS in the cloud too for people who want to just have us hosted too. I mean, this is kind of the long term. I've added on more and more people who have this because I don't have the technical background in this. But we've done some really pretty things now that we're getting out. Questions? Yes. Go ahead. <laughs> Jump the line here. Um, I guess what I'm wondering is, what are you asking for? What are you looking to do now? Are you trying to uh, expand, grow? Uh, are you a one? That, is it just you? Is it just uh, how do you take? I'm not, uh, this is very fascinating. I mean, I, I'll probably be calling you on this. So, uh, but the question is, is that what is it that you are really trying to do? Well, we are scalable because we, we are growing, and I am at the point that we're, we're speaking to other SME subject matter experts to come on board. I have a, a few people that are doing the back end. I'm even connecting with, uh, with another company that they, they really enjoy the design phase more. And you know, Another thing I found, too, is that I'm really the only one that will actually write the course. There are people who do, for instance, coaching. There are boot camps that teach people how to do this, but that's the pain of most people is that they can't either figure out what they have and put it in some sort of a format, and then they don't want to write the course. So, yes. Yeah. Or huh? they suck at writing, yeah. Well, and this is a different kind of writing, too. That's another thing, yeah. too. When you're doing course writing, for instance, Karen had written two really wonderful books, but she had no idea. And I had to go through all of her YouTube videos and all of her articles. One of my clients, too, had something like 100 um, podcasts, and she had 200 YouTube videos, and she she, I, I, she, like myself, I write for Huffington Post. She had a lot of articles. She would written a lot of blogs. So what I'm able to do is go through, and I'm training staff to be able to do that and repurposing. Because once you've written something, if you're not using it, it's not, it's static. It's not dynamic. And so if you have an online platform of some kind, you can monetize. So sometimes you're monetizing directly where people will pay you for your knowledge. And sometimes, for instance, with the doctor that I'm working with, he's monetizing because he's streamlined. He's not using up his staff or his 
his energy to have to say the same thing over and over again. And this is just the, kind of the wave of the future. People are enjoying, there, there's all kinds of new things happening in online education like gamification and really fun infographics. <coughs> yes, we are planning to, to grow this. And certainly in the community, getting the word out, I mean, I have been consistently busy, but we want to be busier. So, yes? Um. I heard you say psychology or psychologists and hypnotherapists. Are you a licensed psychologist and hypnotherapist? And if so, does your course certify? Well, yes. I mean, we, we give it credential. I'm not doing the course in psychology. My course is uh, in holistic health and life coaching. And now we have a certification. And they can do it all online. With the hypnotherapy, there is one aspect that people come in and they're flying in really from all over the world for that one particular hands-on aspect. Yeah. But like I say, I've developed such a relationship with these people that they want to go on study with me. And that's why with my clients, I'm saying, okay, maybe we're only going to launch one course right now. Well, let's just look down the road. And I have found an average of five or six courses with each client that I consult with. We also offer like a free half hour consultation just to kind of show them what the possibilities. Sometimes, for instance, I was working with one woman who uh, is a disability expert, but her, her son recently transgendered and, and she is a therapist too and so we thought well this is really a course that we should probably move on right now because this is this is so in the public domain so yeah so it's more of a credential that, and it's a certification yes so i have a couple questions sure. is there like a minimum or a maximum amount of work that you do and if it's if it sounds like you're going through all these youtube videos and everything what happens when you're at maximum capacity how do you other people to do what you're doing. I'm already training other people how to do it. You know, it's, it's people who have that kind of uh, ability to see the big picture and take information and say that. That's why I like to know, we like to look at other courses down the, the road. The woman that I looked at all her videos, another woman, uh, we've already plotted out three courses. So I was able to take everything and have it in those slots so that if she decides to move on to part two, part three, that's already here. I can do anything from consulting to complete concept creation to turn key where we where we're doing the back end. So we can I can come in at any uh, level. I do have a, a couple of people right now that really want to write their own course. So I'm going to show them how to do it and, and be with them every step of the way. Sometimes they think they're going to do it and then they don't do it. You put them on. It's, it's almost like I know we had a business coach here. It, it, in many ways, I, I am their coach too. But the, the closest thing that I could find when I went online, there was a woman, her name is Janelle, and it's Zen Courses. I found the only thing that I could find is she was charging $3,000 just to coach somebody over the, you know, it's a minimum three month period of time. There are some courses that we can go ahead and write for $3,000. So I think that's a much better use of uh, thing. Just say, I'm going to go to him and then I'll go. <clears throat> you mentioned price the first time. Uh, what is your price structure? You do all different things and all different pieces. How do you price that and how do you do that as a, as a business? Right now, a lot of it is based on the time element. You know, I have a certain amount of money that I kind of, I can, I can guesstimate. Sometimes until you really get in there, you don't know what you're dealing with. Uh, you know, I have kind of a range, you know, we're looking at for consumer courses, maybe between three and 5,000, the certification courses. Uh, might be about you know five to seventy five hundred, but then we have the back end, and luckily the back end person charges a rate that's a lot lower than I am too. So we're trying to you know work with people too, and within uh, the price point, because most instructional design, I mean, they won't even look at you unless you've got at least ten thousand dollars to invest, and it goes way up from there. So, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. So I have, I have a friend who's a subject matter expert, right, internationally, and she paid about. $80,000 because she wrote the script, she hired actors, they did the, you know, videos, da da da, and um, we were just talking the other day. Her, since that launched in 2009, and her return has been over $250,000. Okay, so, that, so we know it works, right? Mm -hmm. and, and she has an audience, she's, you know, unheard of, she has a book that's on its third edition, right? Business book. So my question is, custom writing this, you're not, it's not a template. Is that no, not at all. And then the second part of that question is, how does the person who buys it know they've gotten the information? Is there a test? Is it graded? Is it? Well, there are assessments. 
there are definitely assessments. It depends every single course. Like I just did one for a woman who uh, trains. Uh, she's selling it to doctor's offices to train their front office personnel. And we decided instead of an assessment that they would just go through it at their pace and then they could print out a lot of these LMSs now will print out a certificate. And when you mentioned, we also have Gerard Films, which is a full service uh, production firm too, so that we can help somebody with that aspect of it too. But yes, as you can see, there is a lot of profit to be made in online. Like I say, I have lived literally off the profits. And um, it's been mainly passive. Unfortunately, a lot of people will buy into a course and not do anything with it. I don't get pleasure in that. And I, I try to push my students, come on, come on, I'm here. You know, I'll mentor you, let's do it. But a lot of people want to just keep paying, and, and they'll pay every every year to renew it. You know, so a lot of this is passive income, yes, Sean. So in answering your question, you said it is not. No, no, no. I, I don't oh, work, no, I don't work with the templates. Guess what some of these boot camps will do and yeah. some of these yes. online, you know. My question is, could you so my thought is there's certain sales philosophies, business development philosophies out there. I talk about the value of writing your own book right. to, to show that you're a subject matter expert, things like that. If there is kind of a, an easy process for that, a, a template on to create an online component to that, um, I think you can scale your business. I, I, I think I would like to go in that direction that I'm still new enough that I, and I also get excited and really want to work with the people too. I'm not at all cynical with this yet, you know, so I want to go in and really have that hands-on experience and show people really how much they have there. And that's what nobody else is really doing from what I have found. Yes, sir. Are you naturally drawn to certain types of professional or industries? How do you position yourself? Or just uh, I, I really am interested in a lot of different industries. I'm not exactly an SME when it comes to the technical things, but I can learn very quickly and I might need an SME in something like that. But uh, I have worked in so many different industries already. I mean, I, I tend to really love uh, everything that is involved in natural wellness because that's my own as well Dr. LJ's Natural Wellness Academy. But uh, that said, I, I'm, I'm attracted to a lot of different industries because I love learning. Yes? I, uh, do I understand that your clients basically take your course that you create? No, 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 no. I, I have a course. I have an online course to certify people, but that's separate. This is a brand new business. I actually go in and consult with them to build their own personal course okay. or online course. And do they resell that? I should hope so. Uh, okay, yes. but do you ever have clients that want to take that course, that collaborative course, <coughs> and use it to acquire customers rather than resell? Words, well, it, but it is customized to whatever their message is, and they're selling it for their own purposes. It's not a course that teaches them to do what I do. No, that's not what I meant. So if your client takes you a course through collaboration, and then they have an end product. They don't take a course. That, uh, no, yeah. they take your product. When you get that. It's not a product. Well, my, I, right now, we are the product in terms of we would build, if this gentleman came to me and said, look, I really want to build an online course or an online platform uh, you know, to teach people a very unique way of doing a CPA, then I would work specifically with him to build his own. I would take his expertise and, and leverage what would he have when, when He would have an actual course. Either, either, uh, either he would have the course and, and he would have somebody else do the back end if he had somebody that wants to do the technical, or we would do a turnkey operation. And what would he do with that? Well, that would be the promoting, and we do have now a marketing um, arm to the business. How would he generate it? He would generate income by selling the course, so there is a marketing okay. element That's to what it. That's the, right? the clients resell Or right? either resell it, or they have it as this kind of informational mm -hmm. training. Some people have it, like I say, like this doctor I'm working with has it, and this is a, a benefit that they can, I, I, would, I would love to work with more doctors to even have healthy living and healthy eating as a way of having, you know, you want the more benefits that you can give to your clients, whether it's something that you're going to monetize in the moment or whether you're going to monetize over over time. We'll work for you. Yes. I think the question was, as much as anything, um, can, can someone take, create a course, put it out there to use it to attract clients, in other words, just for that, not revenue purposes, but just as a promotional <laughs> marketing tool. Absolutely, yes, it could be It could be that you have a, it, it, yes, it could be for branding, thank you, that's my husband asking that question to clarify. It could be for a branding tool too, that you are teaching people through an online platform, of course, what you do, because some of us have, 
very informationally intensive businesses, like like when I had my line of products, I wish I would have had something like that because you know I could I could go to a trade show and I could get a retailer really excited about my product, but they didn't know how to train their own staff, and the staff were the ones who were selling it at the client level. Yes. So do you have an online platform so that I can go out and do it, look at what you're doing, and kind of create my own and pay you somehow without being you being involved? Not yet. No, I don't have that. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm planning on starting to do something like that, teleconferences and webinars and then eventually my own boot camp. But right now, we are doing all of that. It seems to me like there's probably 10 people in here that say, oh, I'm an expert, I can do that. But we all have to talk about yeah. it. Well, you'd be surprised. There are, there are courses. You, you can go ahead and Google. There are, there are boot camps. There are um, webinars that will train you how to write your own course, but that's the thing. The highest percentage of those people will never actually write the course. They won't really understand how to do it. They don't know how to break down their information. And that's what I think we're at. We're unique in, but this is something, of course, we do want to scale and be able to offer at a much larger level. Yes, sir. The other problem that you probably have is people are too close to their material. Yes. You have yes. that outside view that allows you to advise them on how to present it <coughs> and how to communicate on a lot of uh, subject matters that's obvious to them and not obvious to their clients. Yes, yes, it's, it, it, that's the thing, is that when you're doing online, you want to keep it simple. You know, the whole keep it simple, stupid. I use the kiss, but it's keep it sophisticatedly simple. Mm -hmm. Because you don't want to insult people's intelligence. You want to make it simplistic, but you don't want to make it too simple that somebody says, oh, come on. You want to have it presented in a way that somebody feels that they really learned something, but there was not that effort. And that's the thing that, you know, this is where we are right now, is that everything has to happen in quick sound bites. With my background in psychology, I think the real advantage that I have is that I create very multi-dimensional courses that can reach all the different types of learning channels. Some of it is experiential, and some of it is visual, and some of it is auditory, and some of it is actual reading, and some of it is, is, is writing. So that's what I really aim for. And we've gotten very good feedback off of our courses. Yes, sir? All right. You mentioned small businesses and, and doctors being potential customers. Have you thought about uh, large corporations? They have a lot of training for, for different uh, The large corporations I haven't gone after because they're the ones that will contact these instructional design companies that are charging that kind of money that uh, that lady mentioned. You know, I, I want to keep it too, because having, being an entrepreneur myself and seeing what it did for me to have that, I want to share that. I want to empower people to have that ability too. So as we grow, perhaps we will be, uh, we will be approached perhaps by that. But really right now I'm focusing on the small business owner and the entrepreneur. On, on what territory? On what territory? You mean one industry? No, no, um, or, or geographic. Well, I, I really have people all over the world right now, but uh, I'd love to build more here in the Tampa St. Pete area, just because it's a, it's enjoyable. I have worked with some people, and it's nice to be able to work with people locally and help them build their businesses here. Uh, this is a pretty strange for, it's kind of hard to price on. Uh, the price range, just for, for based on what I've done so far, is you're looking at probably for consumer course uh, somewhere between about $3,500 to $5,000. And for a certification course, again, it really depends how long, how many hours. It's, it, it really is on a per case, but it is could be maybe better. Uh, eventually. Right now, because this is my, I probably really officially started this last year, last part of the year, so I don't want to put these numbers out. I think in the beginning I did put numbers out that I was guesstimating and I felt like even though I did well, I felt like I was undercutting it a little bit. So. I think, um, you know, if I was ordering something like that, designed a lot of courses, a lot of terrible courses, right? mm -hmm. and um, I think organizing all of the ideas that are going to be introduced, they're about to go into a course, yeah, it's kind of a lead on your website, that would help you organize those ideas before I submit them. So a lot of times we're going to tell you well, what I, what, and I do have that. I do actually, once I start consulting and working with a person and they sign up, I do have those types of things in order to, for, for me to get the information. And the great thing is that there's not that much input needed really from my clients because, you know, I can take their materials and be able to write from there and I give them a detailed questionnaire or a form or, or something and then I'm able to move from there. So, yes? Don't let me leave without comment. Okay. 
I have cards and I'll be here for a little bit. Uh, and like I said, we also have the full service Gerard Films. Uh, my husband, uh, the Independent Film Festival Award. And uh, so we have, you know, we can do anything along those lines and we can do it. Some of them can be done very, very, very simplistically. And when I say low budget, that doesn't mean that it has to look like low budget. Too. So, yes. As you go on and you get more <coughs> customers, <coughs> Do you find it difficult to duplicate yourself? I have a, a few people that I am very confident that can do the work. I always want to have kind of an overview of a little bit of a control freak that way. Um, so I would still want to look at everything. And I, it's kind of hard to explain my process. It's just, it's very easy for me to see how the course can be done. And then there's the, the, the small things. So if I even have that role and have somebody else do some of that other work, that it would work very well. well thank you very much. Oh, one more um, Would you call yourself a four-story development job? That, I guess I have not come up with the title, but uh, it took me a while to know that I was doing instructional design because, like I said, I started this and go, I have a business here. You know, because as soon as I started talking to people about what I was doing, I want you. I want your card. I want to do this. And yeah, it sounds like there's some confusion about what you do, and to me it sounds like you're almost like a software developer, only for Courseware, right? Courseware developer. Yeah, okay. developer. But there's so much also consulting and visionary. I think I'm a visionary more than anything. Yeah, and then I think software earlier. developer is also a consultant. Right, right? okay. I'm, 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 this, this is, is, a, a, this is a work in progress, and I love all your feedback, and I thank you. And, we're on uh, Facebook is Design My Course, uh, Twitter I Design e Courses is, is my, uh, please follow us there. And if you are interested, contact me. I do give a half hour free consultation and I'd love to talk to you about designing the course for you. Yes, sir. So what can we as a group do to help you grow this business? Uh, just if you know anybody who has information that could be streamlined, that could be monetized, that is confused about how to repurpose, their material. I can even give uh, ideas of, of, of how to, to kind of build your brand, which is what a lot, you know, I built, I, I built my own brand in a very short time back, you know, when I, when I built the Mental Wellness brand. So I can do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thanks, everybody, for coming. I know you enjoy coming to One Million Cups. Don't forget about next Wednesday. Cowell Coffee, our great sponsor, we want to thank them as always. Get out in the community, do some great things, and uh, grow your business. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.